microphone to you. <laughs> Bill Wally, so. thank you so much for that warm introduction and for the invitation to come here and speak today. I'm really honored to be part of this speaker series. And I thank all of you for coming today because I know that I am competing with a truly beautiful spring day. <laughs> and so if you want to look out the window, that's fine with me. I know it's gorgeous out there. But, uh, but I do look forward to having some time with you today because this is a topic that I am really passionate about, the practice of hospitality. And so I want to share with you some of the insights I've gained through my travels and my relationships with uh, people such as Bilal. Uh, and uh, I think that this particular mosque is a tremendous model of hospitality. Uh, thank you so much for the food that we've just enjoyed, as well as the chance to join together for fast-breaking dinners in years past. So you all know a great deal about this topic, and uh, I look forward to learning from you as we go into a time of conversation this afternoon. So, hospitality, seeing the holy in others. I think you know the story of Father Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre. He sat at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near. He did not run away from them, but instead ran to meet them and bowed down in a sign of respect. He offered water, shade, rest, bread, curds, milk, and a calf. This is a story common to all three of the Abrahamic traditions. And what happened? Well, the book of Genesis says... The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. And the Quran says, Messengers came unto Abraham with good news. They said, Peace. He answered, Peace, and delayed not to bring a roasted calf. So instead of running for a weapon, instead of uh, putting up a barrier, he offered hospitality. Abraham is for us a great model of hospitality. Last summer I had the great pleasure of visiting Istanbul with an interfaith group led by Imam Bilal Ankaya, and I was pleased to see there in the Palace Museum an artifact called Abraham's Saucepan. Perhaps you've seen it in your own visits to the, the Palace Museum. What a great artifact that is tied to Abraham's hospitality. So from the very earliest days, there's been a link between Father Abraham and this important religious practice. Abraham set an example for us all, and it was picked up by the writers of the New Testament. The Christian letter to the Hebrews says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And I think here's a connection between the Christian understanding of that story and the Muslim understanding of the story. In both stories, the three strangers are described as angels. And so you can see the sign here, which maybe is put up uh, by the Oaks of Mamre, Angel Crossing. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> in that passage from Hebrews, there is a particular Greek word used for hospitality, and that word is philoxenia. Now that is the opposite of a word that we hear used a lot in our society today, xenophobia. I think you've all heard that word, perhaps you've used it, and that literally means fear of the stranger. It's a huge problem we have in the United States today and in the wider world as well. Well, hospitality in the New Testament is the exact opposite of xenophobia. Hospitality is philoxenia, love of the stranger. So literally, in the Christian scriptures, hospitality is stranger love. Stranger love. 
which I think is something we're all challenged to practice. Hospitality is what helps us to see the holy in others, to discover that strangers are not threats, but they bring us some of the holiness of God. So why is the practice of hospitality so difficult? We don't always do it very well in our world today. Well, here in the United States, we're finding that our country is growing increasingly diverse. Minorities will be in the majority by the year 2050. And this is difficult for people because it's sometimes hard to practice hospitality towards people who look and sound different than ourselves. So this is a challenge. People here in the United States are increasingly clustering in lifestyle communities among people like themselves, culturally and politically. Instead of living in diverse communities, people are choosing to live in communities with people just like themselves. And this is a problem because it's hard to learn about the holiness of the stranger when you are choosing only to be with people like yourself. Our country has become increasingly polarized politically. We all know this living as close as we do to Washington, D.C. Conservatives do not sit down and break bread with liberals. They stay in their opposite corners and do not develop relationships. I don't think that God's vision of community has been sufficiently emphasized. In the book of the prophet Isaiah, God says that my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. This is the scripture verse we have on the wall of my church behind the pulpit. I didn't put it there, but it is something that I try to uh, embrace in my own ministry. And finally, I think people who have the aspiration to receive strangers don't have the skills or the techniques. You have to learn how to be hospitable. It's not something that we naturally know how to do when we are born into this world. We have to learn it from our parents. Bilal, I'm sure you learned it from your mother. And uh, Mamet, having uh, had breakfast at your mother's house, I'm sure you learned... Um, uh, hospitality from her. Uh, she practices it well. Uh, and so we have to learn it. It is uh, something <coughs> that is uh, developed. Uh, my wife learned how to throw a party from her mother. I learned how to be welcoming from my father. We have to learn it. And so one of my uh, uh, personal challenges is to go around talking about hospitality and teaching about hospitality. And so I've developed a short course called Hospitality 101. You're not going to get the whole course today, but I'll introduce you to it. Uh, hospitality 101 includes the roots of hospitality and the fruits of hospitality. And the roots are a worship service and a shared meal. And here you see a great example of the interfaith group from last summer having a delicious meal in Istanbul uh, hosted by Bilal. So that's where we begin with the development of uh, hospitable worship services and meals. And out of the roots of hospitality come the fruits of hospitality. And these include the work of reconciliation, peacemaking, outreach into the community, and new perceptions of God's inclusive love. All three of those fruits come out of developing strong roots. Let me say a little more about hospitality in the Christian tradition, which of course is the tradition that I was shaped by. Jesus says in the Gospel according to Matthew, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. The promise that Jesus makes is that he will appear to us in the form of a stranger. And so if we welcome the stranger, we are actually welcoming him. Christians don't always do this very well, but this is the promise that comes to us. If we are willing to welcome strangers, we will be welcoming Jesus. 
Jesus also says, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, these are not normally the categories of people we invite to our parties. But Jesus says, look to the people at the edges, at the margins of society, and make sure you invite them. Look for the people who need hospitality. And out of these teachings of Jesus, the early Christians developed a culture where they saw protecting pilgrims and hosting strangers as both a moral duty and a privilege. And I want to challenge my Christian brothers and sisters today to reclaim this ancient practice, to see welcoming strangers as a privilege, as a gift from God. We need to work on this in the Christian church. But hospitality is by no means only Christian. I think you probably know even better than I, hospitality in the Muslim tradition. Muhammad said, when a person is invited to a feast and he does not accept or reply, he disobeys Allah. So that is uh, placing a very high challenge to people to practice hospitality. It is connected to obedience, obedience to Allah. And furthermore, social functions within the Muslim tradition are recommended in which people should eat together. And the Quran says, gather together at your meals and you will be blessed therein. So a blessing comes from these gatherings. God is present in these gatherings. So, the roots of hospitality, we begin with worship. And uh, we have found, uh, uh, Bilal and me and others, that members of various faiths can worship together, in particular in uh, celebrations such as Thanksgiving, which I would describe as the one true interfaith American holiday. There is no reason that we cannot come together and give thanks to God on this holiday at least once a year. We, we share this, uh, this festival, share this holiday. And so, uh, in such a service, music and prayers from each tradition can be offered. Statements can be given about individual thanksgivings. This past year here in Fairfax, uh, your mosque joined to my congregation and Providence Presbyterian Church in an interfaith Thanksgiving service. And uh, Imam Bilal said, I thank God for living in such a great country and among wonderful friends. What a beautiful statement of thanksgiving and gratitude. There are no religious differences when it comes to giving thanks to God. So let us... Uh, find ways to uh, express our gratitude together. Hospitality can also be practiced by Christian cathedrals towards Muslim friends and by mosques towards Christian groups and others. Uh, this past November you may have read that the Washington National Cathedral hosted a Muslim prayer service for the very first time. And this was part of the cathedral's mission to be a house of prayer for all people and to elevate moderate religious voices, which don't always get heard in our culture today. And at, at, at that time, a Muslim spokesman said that this service was a sign that the Christian community is supporting the religious freedom of Muslims, which can and should be done in every time and place, but isn't always done as it should be. From worship, we go to the second root of hospitality, meals. And here you see a picture of uh, a delicious meal that was served to our interfaith group in Konya. And the family that hosted us is a family that uh, is volunteering every week to help Syrian refugees. The refugees who are so in need of assistance with all of the violence in their country. And I was truly moved, not only by the hospitality that this family showed me, but the hospitality that they are showing their brothers and sisters who are pouring across the border every day. 
Table fellowship is at the very heart of the practice of hospitality. Christians and Jews can accept Muslim invitations to fast-breaking dinners during Ramadan, as our church has, been, has done and enjoyed here at this mosque. And then we can return the invitation to social events at our congregation. I think it was two years ago in June that we uh, had members of the mosque here join us for worship and for a potluck luncheon, and that was uh, a terrific event for members of our church. Uh, we should do that again. Table conversations build relationships. And this is especially true if people talk about common concerns such as child rearing and neighborhood safety. If we go immediately to theology, I think that these conversations can divide. Theology can be difficult because we don't all have the exact same tenets of faith. But our community concerns unite us. And so if we begin at that level, true helpful and healthy bonds can develop. Here's a great example of table fellowship. Mehmet, you recognize this house. This is breakfast at your house, uh, hosted by your mother. And uh, Bilal, it looks like you're about to dig right into that yeah. meal there. You've got your hands out ready to go. After seeing that meal, everything there? Yeah, I yeah. can't wait. <laughs> I think that is all the food we needed for the entire day. <laughs> yeah. James Beard, uh, one of our great celebrity chefs, has said, food is our common ground, a universal experience. When we eat together, we are bound together, and we do uh, discover the presence of God in each other. So, the roots of hospitality, worship, and meals. And out of the, the roots come the fruits. Reconciliation, outreach, and new perceptions of God's inclusive love. So the first of the fruits is reconciliation, peacemaking. And I think I find that when we take time to eat and talk, we discover that in fact the best path, best path to reconciliation <laughs> is through the stomach. <laughs> When people eat together, they come together and are at peace with each other. Uh, the church I served in Alexandria, Virginia was Calvary Presbyterian Church, which uh, is a church I served for 11 years before coming here to Fairfax. And that church grew rapidly through the incorporation of African immigrants. Uh, many uh, Christians in Ghana grew up in Presbyterian churches. And so when they have emigrated to the United States, they have looked for a Presbyterian church to join, which makes perfect sense. And uh, so we were the closest Presbyterian church to a large Ghanaian community, and so they joined our church. And uh, as you know, there can be racial tension, there can be cultural tension when groups come together, but where we always found peace and always found harmony was when we would have international potluck dinners. When Americans and Africans would eat together, they would discover uh, peace and reconciliation. And that can happen, I think, when uh, virtually any groups come together. So to, uh, to be reconciled through hospitality requires the creation of bridge events events that bridge two cultures or groups. Uh, they can be international meals or uh, any other kind of uh, event that can bring two very different groups together for table conversation. At uh, the church I serve, <coughs> Fairfax Presbyterian, once a year we have our youth group sit down with our senior citizens for a shared meal and uh, an afternoon of playing games together. And this really helps the youths to get to know the seniors and to understand each other. So that's a good bridge event. The event. Um, there can be uh, connections made between native-born uh, members of a congregation and immigrants over meals. Uh, and uh, that is what we enjoyed so much at Calvary when we got our native-born American members together with our immigrant members. 
So bridge events are very important for every congregation to offer in ways that are appropriate to that particular community of faith. You can also join with members of another faith, not just a different congregation of your own faith, to do a service project together. I think when people work together for the good of the community, important bonds develop, and there can be peace and reconciliation achieved in a way that would be very difficult otherwise. Well, this brings us to the second fruit of hospitality, which is outreach. And I would describe this as outward-focused hospitality. Often hospitality is inward-focused. It's internal to the community. But this is focused on the world around us. This looks first to the needs of the larger community. Whoops. And uh, can take a number of different forms. So interfaith outreach is a very important way to, uh, to work together today. Um, there's really no reason that members of all three of the Abrahamic faiths cannot work together for the good of our communities. Uh, one example of this was achieved by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to honor the victims of the 9-11 terrorist attacks they began organizing blood drives across the United States in the year 2011. They did, did, did this to affirm their belief and the belief we all share that life is sacred. In three years they organized over 900 of these blood drives helping to save more than 100,000 lives. And in this effort they partnered with the American Red Cross and a number of churches and synagogues and our congregation did host one of these interfaith blood drives, and it was a, a great success. Uh, a lot of blood was donated by members of our church and by the Ahmadiyya community uh, from Centerville. Interfaith outreach can also take the form of uh, food collections for the hungry, blanket drives for refugees, such as the very successful drive that was done for Syrian refugees, and tell me, Bilal, the name of the, what group was responsible for that? I know that you were connected Embrace to Relief. it. Embrace Relief. Embrace Relief. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very successful. And a great uh, interfaith effort. Mm -hmm. And also home building projects in conjunction with groups such as Habitat for Humanity. There's no religious differences that uh, prevent us from joining together for these kind, types of activities. Not every positive interfaith relationship develops face-to-face, -face, talking as we are talking here today. Sometimes the strongest bonds develop when people work shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. So you can have a face-to-face -face relationship, you can also have a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationship. And I think that those are uh, often very powerful bonds. Uh, in particular, men are attracted to these kinds of relationships. Men enjoy working together. They might not always enjoy sitting down and talking face to face. Uh, men don't always enjoy that, but you put a hammer in their hands, give them some good work to do, and they will work hard together. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, my, members of my church uh, began to go to Honduras once a year to uh, uh, do some construction projects as a, at a camp for young people and also at a boarding school for the poor children of Honduras. And uh, most of the men in the group the first year were from my church. All were Christians. But the second year, one of um, uh, the men uh, in the group <coughs> said he wanted to invite his work colleague, uh, a Muslim from Egypt. And so this gentleman joined our group the second year, and we had a fantastic experience working together in Honduras for that year. Uh, it was a great experience for our group, uh, and I think a great experience for him as well. And we uh, uh, not only worked together, but, uh, but prayed together, studied together, and learned a lot uh, in the course of that week. So interfaith outreach can be a powerful way to bond with one another. 
And this brings us to the uh, third fruit of hospitality, perceptions. Uh, does anyone know where this picture was taken? This is the fountain at the tomb of Rumi. And uh, if you've been there, you know that the fountain uh, has water, which pours into this top bowl, and then that the water is divided into two bowls, then divided into three bowls, and then it flows back into two bowls, and finally into the lowest bowl. And this shows that we all come from one God, we live in diverse diverse faiths and cultures, and then return to one God. What a powerful statement of faith in a fountain in Konya. Hospitality brings us together as people of the one God. Showing hospitality to strangers is a powerful way to counter extremism. People who eat, pray, and work together are far less likely to demonize each other. They can guide our communities to a middle path without sacrificing our core convictions because hospitality is already a practice that's deeply rooted in our three Abrahamic faiths. I think one problem with interfaith dialogue sometimes is that we, we end up uh, focusing on, on things that are not really central to our faith. Uh, we talk about things that uh, maybe we have in common, but they're at the edges of our faith. Hospitality is at the core of our faiths. And so we can focus on that and practice on that with real integrity. It's a shared conviction. We can be true to our faiths when we practice it. By practicing hospitality, we can be what I call solid at the center and soft at the edges. Now what does that mean? That's uh, kind of a provocative phrase, solid at the center and soft at the edges. I think this means we're, we're very solid in our core beliefs. We hold tightly to what we believe as Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And we're not asking each other to give up our core convictions. You're not asking me to be any less of a Christian, and I'm not asking you to be any less of a Muslim. We can be solid at the center, but if we're soft at the edges, that means we can be in relationship even though we don't agree about every point of faith. And this is a challenge, I think, for us all, and it's one that allows us to practice hospitality with real integrity. We can agree to disagree about some things, but be very, very uh, uh, sure and solid about the things that are at the center of our uh, religious practices. And when we do this, I think we really have a chance of seeing the holiness of God in each other. We don't have to play games with each other. We don't have to pre pretend we're something we're not. We can be open and honest with each other about our shared convictions and about the things that uh, uh, we disagree on. And when we're honest in that way, we can really see the presence of God. There's no, uh, no holding back. There's no putting on uh, any kind of airs. We're able to be real and honest with each other. So, what can you do? And this is where uh, this afternoon's presentation uh, gives you the chance to talk. I'll put up a few uh, discussion starters, and then uh, I'd love to hear from all of you. What can you do? Where do you see opportunities to practice hospitality? What benefits do you see in the practice of hospitality? What concerns do you have? Where are the problem areas? And what are you willing to do personally as a community of faith? What are you willing to do? So with that, uh, I'll put down the microphone and uh, listen to what you have to say, uh, skilled as